Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to Fortress of the Mind. And in this podcast, I'm going to be responding to an email I received received from a reader in northern Italy, northern Italy. And it's a question involving contemporary events and what a man's reaction should be to certain contemporary events. And let's really see what he has to say. He doesn't really have a specific question. It's more an um, expression of generalized angst, generalized frustration that he feels with the events that are in the news, the current political events. Essentially what he's writing to me about, he feels that a sense of impotence and a sense of power, powerlessness before those who control the public and toward the public, which seems to be totally docile, complacent, and susceptible to manipulation. He says here, we are really meaningless as individuals in the public world, and that meaning, meaninglessness translates to misinformation and deceit. I am reaching out for any piece of advice on how to learn to live with this and possibly what to do about it. Thanks for the help, Quintus. So, the specific context of what he's asking about is he sees current current events, he reads current events, and he's upset about what he sees in the news with the U.S. president and Syria and the obvious backtracking on campaign promises and various levels of deceit that he sees there. And, and essentially what he's asking is, what can we do? What can I do? Why do I feel so angry and powerless about all this? And my answer to him is this. You have to be aware of the things that you can control and the things that you cannot control. This really is where philosophy and your training in philosophy proves its worth. Because if you and I get so upset and frustrated and angst-ridden about current events, we're not going to be any good to anyone. We're not going to be able to function. We're going to be tearing our hair out of our heads for no good reason. And we have to take refuge in the fact that even if human nature is not what we wish it to be, even if it does not rise to that level of perceptiveness, maybe, or to that level of altruism that we wish it could be, we can at least say that it is consistent. We can at least say that it is consistent. And what I mean by this is that human nature has not changed in recorded history in any meaningful way. There are demagogues now. There are demagogues now. We have one now running the country. But such men have always been around. We just have to think back to the days of ancient Rome, ancient Greece, maybe even before then, maybe the the uh, priestly class that ruled ancient Egypt, maybe there were demagogues in amongst those men, I'm sure there were, probably the same in Babylonia, Sumeria, ancient China. Such men are common. They are, they are a permanent feature of social life, a permanent feature of political life. And even in the history of your own country, the, man who, the guy who wrote me this email was from Italy, northern Italy. So I would say, look at, look at your own, the history of your own country. Think back to the fate of Savonarola in the Middle Ages and how he was a clerical demagogue who denounced everyone, and then eventually everyone got tired of him, and he eventually met his end at the stake. And even in the days of ancient Rome, there were demagogues. There were, there were as many demagogues as there were fruits and vegetables sold in the marketplaces. You think back to uh, any number of names. Any number of names. Um... Yeah, they're, they're a permanent feature of political life. 
And what they do is they eventually destroy themselves. They eventually fall victim to their own hubris, their own overreaching, their own foibles, their own arrogance. And we have to take comfort and take refuge in the fact that such people, such manipulative liars, um, will always do themselves in. The big question, and the sole question really for everyone is, can the damage that they do be contained before they destroy institutions permanently? You know, during the presidency of uh, George W. Bush in the early 2000s, serious damage was done to the structural institutions of the United States with his foreign wars, his encroachments upon the rights of citizens. And these habits, once started, proved to be very, very difficult for the government to give up. Such people can do a lot of damage. And a demagogue is limited by the damage he can do only insofar as the institutions that coordinate him and, and, and rein him in can be effective. So we'll have to see just how effective the institutions of this country prove themselves to be in order to keep in check dangerous demagogues or leaders who have no uh, measured self-control, who flit from one thing to the next with the attention span of a ferret and who are themselves susceptible to manipulation by powerful special interests. This is really the question. How much damage can be done? Because at this point, all you can really hope for is that the damage is not going to be too bad, not going to be too extensive. That's really the best you can hope for. So I really wish that I had better uplifting news for you, my friend from northern Italy, who wrote me this email. I wish I could tell you that it doesn't matter, that everything's going to be fine. But the best thing I can say is, we've been down this road before. Demagogues, con artists, scammers, charlatans, demagogues, all of these types of people eventually do themselves in. Eventually, their hubris, their arrogance, their unrestrained ambitions do themselves in. They can take down a lot of people, though, before they do go down. And you'll see that once the publication of my book on Sallust comes out this summer. You'll find the lessons there revealed for all the world to see on the dangers of arrogance, unrestrained ambition, hubris, and what and where eventually that leaves, uh, where that leads a man. You'll, you'll see it all there. We've been down this road many, many times before. The only difference is that people don't really learn from history, or if they, if they do claim that they learn, they learn the wrong lessons. Sometimes it's not even clear what lessons can be learned. One man thinks the lesson is one thing. Another man thinks the lesson is something else. But what I keep coming back to is you can't control that. You can't do anything about that. To get yourself worked up about it, to get yourself obsessed about it, to contort yourself into a ball of fears does no one any good. Keep your finger on the pulse of the news. Stay in tune with what's going on. Keep your situational awareness at a high level of uh, readiness. Always be prepared to respond to things as you see them. But realize there's only so much you can do. There's only so much you can do. And it's the hardest thing in the world to sit by and watch disasters unfold and not be able to do anything about it. This is truly, this is truly a hell to be in that situation. But what can you do? This is where your philosophical training, your depth of, of, of learning needs to be brought to bear 
to calm your nerves and to take the bigger approach. What I want to do now, and I've gotten a couple questions about this, I want to read to you the poem, The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. It's one of my one of my favorites. And I know that a lot of you guys like to listen to these podcasts uh, when you're going about your life, going about your job in your car or whatever. And so maybe it'll it will be nice for you to hear this poem read by me. And you can reflect on it because sometimes it's nice to hear poetry read aloud, especially when the poem is a short one like this one. So I'm going to do that. And I want you, when I'm done with this poem, to reflect on what this means. Who are the hollow men? Who is a hollow man? It is a man of no substance, a man of no substance, of no no firm constitution, a man who drifts this way and that, motivated only by his own vain ambition, his own ego, his own lies. And if nothing else, this should be a cautionary tale, a cautionary story for you to not end up this way. Be a man of substance. Be a real man. Stand for something. Believe in something. So here it is, The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. A penny for the old guy. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together. Headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind and dry grass or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men, Eyes I dare not meet in dreams. In death's dream kingdom these do not appear. There, the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging and voices are in the winds singing. More distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me... Also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crowskin, crossed staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land, this is the cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom? Waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the Tumid River. Sightless, unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the only, the hope only of empty men. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the repose falls the shadow. Life is very long. 
between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is life is. For thine is the this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs>